Good morning. <laughs> Welcome back from community time. We are continuing this morning with a foundational new series. It's our second series in the book of Genesis. I don't know how many series are going to be found in the book of Genesis, but we're in the second one. The first one took us through the first 11 chapters, and uh, now we're in the next set of chapters from chapter 12 to 25. And it's called Father Abraham Living the Life of Faith or Living La Vida Fide. I could sing it, but I won't. The story of Abraham begins with his call. God called him. It happened in Genesis 11 and Genesis 12. It was a call from God to come out and leave the world that he was living in. Leave the country that he was living in. Leave his life of idolatry. Leave his life of moon worship. That's what he did. He was a moon worshiper. And the call was to stop walking up the stairs of the ziggurat in Ur, just like the Tower of Babel. They had their own. It was built 100 years before Abram. He surely walked these stairs. And I like this picture better than the one I've shown you before. You know why? This one was taken in 1920 before there were any renovations done on it. This is the original. This thing is is so old, and Abram would have walked up those stairs of that ziggurat in Ur. God's call to him was, stop walking up those stairs and start walking with me by faith. Go to this new land and walk with me by faith. So what is next for Abram after God calls him? Well, it's the same thing for you and same thing for me. Those he called, he justified. That's what's next. And that's exactly where we're going this morning. Abram has been called, and his story continues by being justified. And of course, this is a central theme. Dare I say it's the central theme of theology in the New Testament? I don't think I quite dare say it is the central theme, but it is a central theme. It is what comes next after you respond to God's call. With faith. When you respond to God's call by faith, next comes his justification. He justifies you. For God had said to Abram, go from your country, your, pe- your people, your father's household. Go to the land that I'm going to show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So what did Abraham do? Abraham responded with faith, and it was very practical faith. He went. He went north, putting one foot in front of the other. How much more practical can your faith possibly be? God said, go, and he went. And when there was trouble between Abraham's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen, Abram gave up the well-watered plains of Sodom, which was the best land, and he just simply gave it to his nephew Lot. How much more practical can your faith be than to do something like that? And then when the regional kings invaded to pillage and loot Sodom and took Lot as one of their hostages, Abram puts on his general's uniform and he marshals his entire household of servants and hooks up with other allies and conquers those regional kings. Again, I ask, how much more practical can your faith possibly be? If you have to go to war, you go to war. Should we be surprised by the practicality of Abram's faith? I don't think so, because this is the life of faith for the called and the justified people of God. Some people think that having faith in God means adopting a barren life of contemplation, uh, going somewhere private and far away and just simply think about these abstract propositions A, B, and C and quietly mull them over in your mind until you fall over of old age. That is not the Christian faith. That was not Abram's faith and it should be none of our faith. Christian faith is practical like Abram's. Christian faith shows itself. Where does Christian faith show itself? Well, it shows itself 
everywhere. It shows up in the home. It shows up in the warehouse. It shows up at the office. It shows up on the street. When does Christian faith show up? It shows up always, every single day of the week. To whom does the Christian faith show itself? It shows itself to everybody. To close family members, it shows to your wife, to your husband. It shows to complete strangers and everybody in between. Last week we saw how God comforted Abram in the dark night of his soul. Do you remember it? And maybe God has comforted you in the dark night of your soul as well with the same words. They were beautiful words. Do you remember them? Don't be afraid. I am your shield and I'm your very great reward. There we go. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and I'm your very great reward. Let's meditate and think on the meditate. You can meditate on that. There is much comfort to be found in these words and much comfort to be found in God's words. But we're going to now pick up the next part of this passage, what follows immediately after. Here it is. God called Abram, then he comforted Abram, and now Abram receives this open declaration concerning his justification. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. This verse turned out to be one of the Apostle Paul's favorite, favorite verses. He, he quotes it precisely twice but he makes about 10 allusions to it in his writing. Paul builds on this very verse extensively. He uses this verse as the very cornerstone to explain how it happens that people can be saved. The two places where he quotes it directly are in Romans 4 
which Hunts read, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abram was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What the scriptures say, Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And Galatians 3 reflects very much the same reasoning. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then Paul adds this, So understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. So how is it, dear friends, that we may be saved? How is it that the wrath of God may be turned away from sinful man like me? There is only one answer and one answer only to that question, and that is to be justified by faith. Now, you may not know what justification by faith is. You may be a little bit fuzzy on the particulars of what it's all about. Or you may have never heard a single sermon in your entire life on those three words before, justification by faith. On the other hand, you, have may, you may have heard many sermons on how to be happy, or sermons on words that win, or your glorious breakthrough, or today is your day, or healthy, whole, and free or achieving the dream within you, or reaching your destiny. But you've never heard a sermon about the only way that a man may be saved eternally. That was announced already in the life of Father Abraham, who is the father of faith and the father of the faithful. Well, with the Holy Spirit's help this morning, if he will tune your ears and if he will open up your heart, may you hear just such a sermon today. The question before us is this. How was Abraham justified? How was he declared righteous? Which is the meaning of the word justification. How was he accepted by God? How was he counted as a child of God? There are six things we want to quickly go through. Number one, Abram was justified not by his works. We all agree that Abram wasn't perfect. But many were the good works of Abram. We'll also agree on that. He did very well to hear God's call in the first place. And he did very well to act on that call and leave his country and leave his people. And then he did very well to separate from his nephew Lot in such a noble, gracious way. He did very well to gather up his courage and go after those robber regional kings. He did very well to say, No, I'm not accepting a red cent from the king of Sodom. Nothing. He did very well to give a tithe of all of his possessions to Melchizedek. Abram's good works were impressive and very good. And yet none of that is mentioned in our text. It simply says that Abram believed the Lord. And he credited that to him as righteousness. So obviously, if Abram, after years of holy living, is not justified by his works, but is accepted by God only on account of his faith, then how much more must be the case with someone who is less holy than Abram, someone like me, someone like the thief on the cross, someone like you? None of us can be justified by our works. Secondly, Abram was justified not by obedience to ceremonial law. Just as Christians sometimes attach too much worth to their baptism or to their church membership or to their participation in the Lord's Supper, so it was back in Paul's day that Jewish men attached too much worth to their circumcision. But the Apostle Paul scores a very important point that I can't believe that the Jews and the Hebrews and the Israelites in that day didn't notice earlier. He scores an important point when he points out that Abram was justified by faith long before, long before 
He was even circumcised. Paul points this out in Romans 4. He says, We have been saying that Abram's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after. It was before. In other words, Abram did not rest on any ceremonial aspect. He did not rest on any ceremonial aspect of his relationship with God. It was this. Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord credited that to him as righteousness. Abram rested on his faith. He rested on nothing but his faith. And so we have to keep in mind, baptism is beautiful, but it cannot justify. It does not justify. Partaking of the Lord's Supper is beautiful, but it cannot make you acceptable before God. It's by faith. It's by faith alone. So Abram was justified then by believing the promise. And I love that part of the story where God takes Abram outside. No street lamps, nothing to wash out the stars. Takes him outside and he says, look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. And then he said to Abram, so shall your Zerah be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. The word Zerah is translated these days as offspring. So shall your offspring be. But more traditionally, the word is translated as seed. Seed. So shall your seed be. Yeah. Again, we turn now to the Apostle Paul, who makes a critically important point. That will be missed by all of us if we just look at this. So shall your zura be. The point that the Apostle Paul makes is this. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say and to seeds, plural, meaning many people, but it says and to your seed, zura. Meaning, now get, get a load of this, meaning one person who is Christ. Wait a minute. So shall your Zerah be, and Paul interprets that, meaning one person who is Christ. This is so amazing, it makes your head hurt after it sinks in if your head doesn't hurt right now it hasn't sunk in so let me explain it the zara so shall your zara be the seed the offspring which god is promising to abram is not only the multitude of descendants to come from abram but it is also the one through whom the whole world will be blessed who is Christ, and here's the part that makes your head hurt, and it is the one in whom would rest all believers who are in Christ. Don't we always say, the scriptures say, we believers, we are in Christ. So we are in him as our head. Christ is our head. We are in Christ and so this is a reference, so shall your Zerah be. That includes us who believe. We are part of that singular seed who is Christ. If you're in Christ, you're in that seed. Does your head hurt now? Yeah, kind of does. This is very serious theology, folks. This is the thing that links the Old Testament and the New Testament theology together. So because our head hurts, we need to stop for a little breather, and let's just see if we're catching on. Here we go. All right. Justification by faith for $200. Here we go. Question number one. A living faith always produces practical works. True or false? Let's see. Excellent. Good. 
Justification by faith for 400, please, Alex. All right. Faith and works cooperate together to justify the soul before God. True or false? Let's see if you're right. Excellent. Good job. And justification by faith for 600. We are made righteous only by faith in the work of Jesus Christ. True or false? Let's see. Yes. All right, three for three. Good job, good job, good job. And we can summarize all this with the apostles' own words. Same chapter. Abram's faith was credited to him as righteousness. The words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Faith, justification by faith in Christ alone. Let's keep going. I'll explain the picture in a second. But let me just say, Abram was justified by an imperfect faith. This should be of comfort. This should be of comfort to us. Do not be intimidated by Abram's faith. We have seen on several occasions, ever since July the 22nd when we started down this path, we have seen on several occasions that Abram's faith was imperfect. It was imperfect before he was justified by it. And as the the story continues to roll forward, we're going to see that it was an imperfect faith after it justified him. And yet, Abram's faith justified him perfectly. Perfectly. And so we may safely conclude that you and I don't need to have a perfect faith. What we do need is a simple faith and a true faith. And Jesus said as long as it's the size of a mustard seed, that was good enough. And he said if you had faith like a little child, that was enough. But he also said every day make sure you pray, Lord Increase our faith, and so should we. But just know this, that if you have faith, even imperfect faith, even if your faith is a little bit halting, it will still justify you through Christ Jesus. Now the picture, just because your hand is weak and unsteady, the medicine will still work. Abram was justified by faith in the object of faith, who is Christ, the Zerah. Faith by itself doesn't mean a thing. There are faith teachers these days that talk about faith like it's the thing. It's the thing. It's everything. That's not true. Faith does not exist in a vacuum. Faith in a vacuum is meaningless. Faith in a vacuum is a joke. Faith cannot stand on its own. And faith will never be its own righteousness. The nature of faith is to look beyond yourself, to look outside of yourself, to the object of faith. Now it helps if you were pretty good in grammar as a kid. The object of faith, who is Christ. His work, his atonement, his resurrection. When some faith teachers say to put your faith in faith, they are so far off base. Faith in faith is meaningless. It tears out the very heart of the gospel. And sadly, that's exactly what is preached in many a sermon and in many places instead of true faith in Jesus Christ as the solution for man. Instead of looking to him... A lot of times in sermons these days, you're instructed to look in the mirror. I'm going to quote a paragraph from the most popular sermon on YouTube. This is the number one sermon on the entire YouTube. It says this, Get up in the morning and invite good things into yourself. I am blessed. I am strong. I am talented. I am disciplined. I am focused. I am prosperous. When you talk like that, talent gets summoned by Almighty God 
go and find that person. Health, strength, abundance, discipline starts heading your way. Apparently, the solution to sin is in our mind rather than in God. The solution to sin is to elevate your self-esteem. The solution to sin is just to say the right words to yourself. But that's not the gospel because it is not faith in the one who justifies. Abram believed the Lord. Uh, I see. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is the message of the Bible, laid down as the foundation in the Old Testament, and then it is built up into this magnificent structure and temple in the New Testament. And it boils down to one sentence. Man may be perfectly justified by God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. But the question that we all want to have answered is this, at least I do. Did Abraham understand this? Or I should say Abram because his name has not been changed yet. Did Abram understand this? How much did Abram understand? Did God open up to him and tell him about the promised Zerah, the promised seed? I think the answer is, clearly, Abram knew a whole lot more than we give him credit for. And God told Abram a whole lot more than we give him credit for. Abram understood very well that he would have a offspring through whom all the world would be blessed. That was clear in the original promise. Abram may also have understood that the same offspring that was promised to Eve in the Garden of Eden was the offspring that God had promised to him. So we're talking about Genesis chapter 3, when God, through judging the serpent, promised Eve that there would be one coming who would be against the evil one. But Abram even understood more. How do we know that he understood more? Well, I don't know if you ever noticed this line in John chapter 8. It comes after this long debate that Jesus has, this running debate with the Pharisees. And then he pulls out this. And Jesus says to these angry Pharisees who are at the verge of stoning him, he says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. From this, and also from the end of chapter 4 of Romans, which you can look again at your own, we can conclude that the faith that justified Abram, the faith that was credited to him as righteousness, had Christ in it for certain. He saw Christ in the Zerah. He rejoiced in Christ. Abram saw Jesus coming with eyes of faith, he saw multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of people who would believe in the promised Zerah. And God justified Abram as a result of his faith in this promise. So that today, you may have 10,000 sins against you, accusing you, condemning you, and yet you are justified and vindicated and washed and declared righteous and whiter than snow if you have faith in Christ, the promised one, through whom all the world would be blessed. You may be a sinner like Samson. You may have fallen like David. You may have slipped up like Noah. But if you have true and living faith, your name is written down among the justified God has accepted you, and he sees the beautiful, shining gem of faith that glows and gleams in your heart. He takes you not for what you are, but he takes you for what is in your heart. He covers your sin with his atoning blood. He dresses you in the finest clothing of righteousness. He sees you in the Beloved. He sees you accepted in the great I am.
Last, Abram was justified by faith in a promise that seemed impossible. Time was moving on for Abram. Abram was nearly 100 years old and his wife just a, a shade younger. Not only were they old, but Sarai, which is the way you pronounce it before her name was changed, Sarai was, by this point in her life, understood to be barren, unable to have children. So if you've got age and you've got barrenness, you might refer to Abram and Sarai, their potential to have children as twice dead. And yet it says, nevertheless, Abram believed. And the faith that justifies you and me, this is very important, the faith that justifies you and me has to be cut from the same cloth, exactly the same cloth, so that you can say, let it be known far and wide, let the mountains shout to the valleys this very truth. And the truth is this, that it is impossible that I should ever be saved. It is impossible because I am twice dead in these two ways. I'm dead in my sinful nature, I know that, and I'm dead in my sinful behavior. I'm dead twice, just the way Abram and Sarai were dead. I can't save myself, I know that. I know that in my flesh there's nothing good. I've proven that 10,000 times. I know that under the law's condemnation, I'm just a broken, broken man. I'm corrupt. My sinful nature is a wreck. And yet for all of that, I do believe one thing. I believe that through the life of Christ, I shall live. That I shall inherit the promised blessing of Abram. And I will be one of those stars, one of those innumerable stars in the sky that I am part of of the Zerah. I am part of the offspring. I'm part of the seed with Christ. And I love the words of this hymn, my faith looks up to thee. That's where the star, that's where the Lord reigns up above. That's where the stars are. My faith looks up to thee, thou lamb of Calvary, savior divine. Now hear me when I pray. Take all my guilt away. Oh, let me from this day be wholly thine. In the teeth of all of my sins and all of my accusations of conscience, I believe in the one who justifies the ungodly. This is again one of Paul's arguments. To the one who does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. That word ungodly is really important because we don't believe in a savior of saints. You know why? Because that might be possible. But we believe in a savior of sinners because that is is not possible. That is impossible. This is the faith that justifies. So in conclusion, I will ask this. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Can you believe that despite the fact that you're a sinner, that you are nevertheless a child of Abraham's? Can you believe that you are a son, a daughter, an heir, an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ himself? Can you believe that the promised land of heaven is yours? with all of its joys and ecstasies, in all of its infinities of bliss? Can you believe that you'll be with God, with Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and all of his glory? Can you believe it? This is the faith that justifies. This faith is so high, it is so wide, it's so deep, it's so long, it's so broad, it's so large, it's like the sand On the seashore, it is like the stars in the sky, and so shall your offspring be. Is that you? Are you in there, in the Zerah? Are you in there? Are you the offspring of Abram or no? Can you legitimately say, Father Abraham had many sons, and I am one of them. I am one of them. All this mercy to be washed whiter than snow, all this righteousness to be made perfectly holy, all this love that streams from a fountain that never runs dry, all this protection and providence to watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore, all of this heaven in the life to come. Can you believe it? A harp for you, a crown for you, 
a palm branch for you, a throne for you from where you can clearly see the face of Jesus, made like as unto him, reigning with him. Can you believe it? Is that you there? Say it with the apostle then. Let's say this together. Together. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We're going to say it again and we're going to say it with all of our heart. Believe your God now. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. May the Holy Spirit lead you to a place of faith and trust in him. You know what Jesus said in John 6? This is the work of God, to believe in Jesus Christ whom he sent. I don't know whatever you think the work of God is, but that's the work Jesus said we have to do. Just believe. Just believe. Give yourself to him alone, and he will save you. He doesn't ask one iota from you except faith. That's the only thing he asks And even faith, he's willing to give that to you as a gift. If you have the tiniest amount of imperfect faith in Christ, all of your doubts combined with all of your sins, combined with all of your trials, combined with all of your troubles, cannot and will not ever shut you out of heaven. This is the faith that justifies. Can you believe it? Then let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the cohesiveness between the Old and the New Testament. We thank you that there is no change there between faith in the Old Testament and faith in the New. We thank you, Lord, that the very one that you chose at the beginning to become the father of faith is really the father of us all because he already saw the day of Christ coming and you informed him of so much. And he put his faith in you, and you credited it to him as righteousness. And now as we fast forward all these years to this very day, you ask each one of us the very same question. Can you believe it? Do you believe that you will be part of this offspring, this Zerah, that you are in the Zerah, that you will be like one of the stars in the sky, like one of the grains of sand on the seashore, belonging to me, a child of faith, Lord, I thank you for this um, invitation, and I thank you, Lord, for the strength, the security, the joy, the peace, and all the good things that flow from our faith in you. We believe. Help our unbelief increase our faith from this moment on. In Jesus' name, amen.